Now I can hear the objections to the previous part now. If God is the source of the moral law and we need him to understand good and evil and without him we all turn into mouldy apples, then why is it that people who reject him are still capable of good deeds? Atheists do good things all the time, and people who reject God don't instantly turn into immoral axe murderers. And what about people of other religions who believe in a different God? You get nice people all around the world regardless of their religion. You don't have to be a Christian to be a good person. So this theory just doesn't work, right? Well, let's take this a step at a time and explore why it is that atheists and non-Christians in general may still adhere to the moral law instinctively without necessarily recognizing that it flows from God. We can give four reasons which I will summarize with four C's. They are the conscience, creation, civil laws and the Great Commission. The Bible tells us that God has written his moral law into the hearts of every human being and that it speaks to everyone through their consciences. Paul writes in Romans that even when Gentiles who do not have God's written law instinctively follow what the law says, they show that in their hearts they know right from wrong. They demonstrate that God's law is written within them for their own consciences either accuse them or tell them they are doing what's right. Every single human being in the world has been given a conscience which gives everyone an instinctive sense of right and wrong. We all have this little voice inside our spirits that reminds us of the moral law, often when we least want to hear it. In fact, quite often it tells us to do the exact opposite of what we prefer to do. In times gone by, the moral law was frequently referred to as the natural law or the law of nature because it was considered natural and instinctive to all human beings. This is reason number one why non-Christians who live under a do-what-you-want moral code don't instantly turn into axe murderers. Their consciences act as a restraint on their selfish desires. Secondly, the Bible tells us that God has revealed himself to everyone everywhere through his creation. For the truth about God is known to them instinctively. God has put this knowledge in their hearts. From the time the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky and all that God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse whatsoever for not knowing God. It's beyond the scope of this series to explore in detail how God has revealed himself through creation, but it doesn't take a PhD in science to look around and see the diversity, beauty, complexity, functionality and magnitude of the world and conclude that there must be an amazing creator behind it all. Creation informs us of the creator in the exact same way that a building informs us of the builder and a painting informs us of the painter. Just as you can get insight into the person of Van Gogh by looking at one of Van Gogh's paintings, you can get insight into God by looking at God's creation. Nature reflects who God is and speaks to us about his character. In this sense, God's design for creation automatically acts as a restraint on our moral conduct by demanding our cooperation with nature. For example, if we want to have babies, creation says that can only happen one way, between one man and one woman. If we try to go against creation and procreate within same-sex partnerships, we are wasting our time. It just can't happen. So we are forced by the design of God's creation, which reflects his character, to have natural sexual relations if we want to have a family, and there is no other option. Creation is informing us of the creator here. Indeed, whenever we act against our natural design or the natural order of creation, we tend to find there is a price to pay. If we drink excessively, our body gets hangovers, which makes us feel rotten. If we persist, we may even get liver disease. If we consistently eat more than our bodies need out of selfish greed, we become obese and develop health problems. If we look to selfishly sleep around, we feel tremendous emotional pain, guilt and feelings of worthlessness. We may also pick up sexually transmitted infections. So again, if you want to stay healthy and happy, we are forced to cooperate with creation. We are forced to live according to God's design. In that sense, creation informs us of the moral law and restricts us from falling into complete do-what-you-want selfishness. God speaks to us through what he has made. I also love the quote by Abraham Lincoln where he said, I can see how it might be possible for a man to look down upon the earth and be an atheist, but I cannot conceive how he could look up into the heavens and say there is no God. Creation tells us that there must be some meaning to all this. We instinctively know it. 
Thirdly, human beings are smart enough to know that society needs a moral code to function. So generally speaking, God's moral law is upheld by the civil law of the land. For example, the moral law says that murder is wrong, so in most countries the civil law will say that murder is illegal. If you murder someone, the local police force will come after you and the judiciary system will make you pay. Obviously that acts as a deterrent to do what you want living. Likewise, the moral law says that stealing is wrong, so in most countries theft will be illegal. In other words, God's voice is heard through the civil laws of the land which are upheld and enforced by the human authorities. In that sense, the government and civil authorities of a nation actually do God's bidding. Even though we may want to do what we want, we are informed, restrained and penalised by the civil law. And this is reason number three why we don't all immediately become fantastically immoral without God. It's important to note, however, that what is legal and what is morally right isn't always the same thing. For example, everything the Nazis did in Germany was legal according to their civil law at the time, but it was not morally correct. The fourth reason why people around the world have a general adherence to the moral law is because of Jesus' last command to Christians before he ascended to heaven. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now this is known as the Great Commission. Jesus left his followers the task of going into the world spreading the gospel message, and this they were to do diligently until the day of his return. Because many Christians have taken this commission so seriously, there have for the past 2,000 years been people going into every corner of the world, teaching, evangelizing, witnessing and going on missionary journeys. Consequently, Christian morality has spread far and wide across the globe and has civilized and influenced the world in more ways than it realizes or would want to acknowledge. I think it's worth explaining just how much, so that's what we'll do in the next part.